Testing, testing. Sound check. Thank you, Michelle. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to just say a couple words of thank you to the staff, of course, for years and years of work and a lot of work in the last months, especially getting ready for this. To the panelists and all of the people who have worked on it with our staff and who have been in the field experiencing all of this for a lot of years. Thank you to all of you. Um, I'm Mary Wall, Chair of the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission. I'd like to call the meeting to order. And I'm from Langweiss on Oregon's South Coast. And I think we'll just introduce the other commissioners, let them introduce themselves, introduce the director, and then we'll go right over to staff to get this kicked off. So welcome and thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mark Labhart. I'm uh, privileged to serve on the commission. I live in Sisters. I'm uh, Becky Hatfield Hyde, and I live near Brothers, Oregon. Bob Spellbrink uh, for Sleds, Oregon. Leslie King, I'm in Portland, Oregon. Kim? Kathy and Khalil, also Portland, Oregon. <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Wall. I'm Kurt Melcher. I'm the director of the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and welcome here today. We're going to have a, a uh, I guess, about a four hour stint, something like that. I did want to just uh, offer my appreciation to Michelle Tate, who keeps us moving, not just when we're in headquarters, but also on the road. And as you all know, we had a little snafu this week when our sound system was stolen in a burglary. <clears throat> so this is officially duct tape and bailing wire at its best, but I, I'm, we're hopeful that it's all going to work as planned. Thank you. Thanks. And speaking of Michelle, Michelle, would you like to just introduce yourself and tell us anything about the system that we should know or be careful with? Um, good afternoon. I'm Michelle Tate. I'm with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, this is a little bit different than the system we usually have. One of the things I want you to keep in mind um, when these microphones are more sensitive than the ones that we have, and they pick up a lot of the conversation in the room that we don't typically have to worry about. So if you've got conversations, it's probably a good idea to step out of the room for those so that it doesn't get picked up on the recording and on the team speed. Good to know. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I would like to then thank you all once again for being here. We do have a full schedule, so I'll be a little brutal in moving us along if I can, um, but I'd like to first introduce Sean Clements and he's going to kick this off. Uh, cheers. Um, Chair Wall, Commissioners, Director Melcher, Sean Clements, the Acting Deputy Director here in the department. Um, and we're about to close out another year here, and I just want to start by thanking you all for your service to fish, wildlife, and their habitats this past year. I think together and with partners, many of whom are in this room, we've done a lot of good things this year and a lot to be um, proud of. Today, we're here to talk about wolves, and that's not a subject I've really thought too deeply about the past few years. But I am particularly grateful to have had the opportunity the last three months to work with division leadership, um, with the staff in the field on a number of issues, including wolves. And I've really learned a lot and um, I have great respect for the folks that work on this issue of wolves and wolf management and that are um, kind of the front line of making sure that wolves have a home in Oregon for years to come. And so we're going to switch now to the workshop. Um, this is going to be a lot of work today. It's going to be fast paced. We've got a lot to get through. You're going to hear some presentations from staff about the wolf plan and our implementation of it and our review of it. We've also got two panels lined up to talk about two of the most pressing issues going forward for, for management. So I think it's going to be engaging. I think you'll get a lot out of it and we hope that you have some back and forth with both staff and panelists. And I couldn't think of a better way to start this off than by talking about how far we've come in the last 20 years since that first wolf crossed back into Oregon. And I couldn't think of a better person to give that presentation than uh, Roblin Brown, who's here today, who's been uh, really instrumental in the progress we've been able to make. So I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you, Sean. Good afternoon. Like Sean said, I'm the Wolf Program Coordinator from LaGrande, Oregon. 
uh, working at Legrand. I'll start by sharing about how wolf recolonization is progressing. The Oregon Wolf Plan promotes the natural expansion of wolves within suitable habitat across Oregon. In the last 15 years, we've gone from zero to almost 200 wolves in Oregon. That's a big accomplishment. So let's start with why wolves were missing from Oregon. During the 1800s, the increasing population of European descendants immigrating into Oregon had a negative effect on the wildlife. Unregulated market and subsistence hunting dramatically reduced our populations of deer, elk, bighorn sheep, and mountain goat. The new residents of Oregon needed to raise livestock in order to survive. Those animals were at risk of depredation by the native wolves, bears, cougars, and coyotes, especially as native prey disappeared from areas and was replaced with cattle, sheep, and goats. Across the West and in Oregon, there was an agreement widely that wolves and other predators needed to be killed off, even in Yellowstone National Park. Bounties were put in place in Oregon in 1843, and the last wolf bounty was paid in 1947. For the next three generations, farmers and ranchers did not need to worry about wolves killing their livestock. But during that time, public sentiment about wildlife, including predators, changed. The first state game warden and the first Oregon Fish and Game Commission started reintroducing elk to Oregon in 1912. And that followed with numerous reproduction, reintroductions of bighorn sheep and mountain goats. And by the 1970s, the Endangered Species Act, with strong public support, allowed for the protection of rare species and the reintroduction of animals that were no longer in their historical habitats. That included wolves. Wolves were not reintroduced to Oregon. Wolves were able to recolonize all by themselves with their natural ability to travel long distances. You don't need to forward the slides yet, thanks. Um, and wolves had already recolonized from Canada into northwestern Montana in the mid-1980s. Later, wolves were reintroduced into central Idaho and the Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming in 1995 and 1996 by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Wolves entered Oregon by 1999, and by 2008, we already had our first known reproduction of wolves in 60 years without a reintroduction. So these maps that you're seeing up there are starting with the two packs in 2009. These maps show the expansion of resident wolves across Oregon as they explored new areas, set up territories, bred, raised pups to grow up, disperse, and expand further in the state. Next. Roblin, no one can hear you, but I hear a whole lot of static. Oh, thank you for telling me that. I appreciate that. A little bit closer. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that, Commissioner King. Thank you. And are we in <laughs> And also, I hear, like, I guess it's that background noise, the static. That's what I hear, not Rob Lent. I think that's the speakers. And if you want to, you can go to the 2022 slide. Technology is going on, especially when it's not even yours. <laughs> Two more, Roxy. So there'll be a slide that says 2023, 2022 on the left side. Great. Thank you so much for putting that slide up. So this is great to see. So we've got this is where we're at in 2022. After starting with two, two packs in 2009, 2009, we saw the expansion of wolves across the state. We counted 24 packs spread from Northeast Oregon to the Northern and Southern Cascades. And we have even documented wolves in the coastal range by 2022. The blue areas on this map show where there is predicted suitable habitat for wolves. 
Since there are large areas of vacant habitat in the Blue Mountains, Cascades, and coastal ranges, the population will continue to increase in those areas. In areas where the suitable habitat is occupied and packs are overlapping each other, we'll see the population growth rates start to slow and stabilize as packs compete with each other for resources. The population will reach a point in each area where there's no more space for more wolf packs. This is starting to happen in a couple of areas north of I-84 in Northeast Oregon. Another technical difficulty, my apologies. <laughs> OK, it's more fun when I wing it anyway. <laughs> so you'll see in this slide that we have a lot of areas where we have open areas of vacant habitat. We have areas where we have packs that are just starting. And then northeast Oregon, north of I-84, you see packs that are smaller and they're overlapping each other. We have less vacant habitat in those areas. You can go to the next slide. As the population increased, as, it, as the population expanded across the state, obviously the in population increased as well. So for the first seven years, the population increased by almost 42%. For the next five years, it increased for about 10%. And for the last two years, it's increased for about 2%. And that's weighted by the fact that most of the wolves are in Northeast Oregon. And that shows that the population is becoming more saturated in Northeast Oregon and the population is becoming more stable with that number. But if you look at um, Western wolf management zone, the population there is starting to increase very strongly as well. And it was 39% in the Western wolf management zone last year. So with all of the monitoring successes we've had with radio and collaring wolves in Oregon, we've been able to see, that's fine, you can go to the next slide, appreciate it. We've been able to see that survival is remarkably high. Our wildlife research mm -hmm. team in East region did a survival analysis. And adult wolves that stay in the state of Oregon have an 87% chance of staying alive until the next year. Next slide, Roxy. That's a remarkably high survival rate compared to other areas, including the Northern Rocky Mountains. It's also higher than some really protected areas, such as Yellowstone National Park, um, the Voyagers area up in Minnesota, and uh, the Mexican Wolf Program down in Arizona and New Mexico. If you look at uh, expansion of wolves across the state. They've also expanded out to other states. So we've had wolves, radio collared wolves from Oregon go to California, to Washington, Montana, Idaho. And now we're reaching the next stage of conservation and recovery of wolves in the West. And the state of Colorado is going to come to Oregon and try to collect 10 wolves to release in Colorado um, before the end of this year. So we're gonna see more recovery of wolves across the West. Uh, thanks, Robin. So uh, it's a shame we had technical difficulties there because I think when you step through those maps, it was really remarkable to see that dispersal across the landscape in the last 20 years. And to think about the distances some of those wolves traveled, even as far down as Southern California, pretty, pretty amazing. And now we want to transition into talking a little bit about um, the plan that underpins all of that, which is the wolf plan and our review of it. And so we're gonna have Derek and Brian um, discuss that. But if there are any questions um, for Roblin before we dive into that, I think there's a, is there a couple minutes here? Thank you, thank you, Roblin. I actually have one question and then I'll look to the other commissioners to see if they do as well. A lot of people would look at the, just the last three bars on your population numbers and see that it's pretty flat and pretty level in terms of the total increase in Oregon and wouldn't call it a success, but we're looking at it as a success. So could you give a very short description of why we're calling it success when we have very level numbers totals? Yeah, so eventually, if you think about it this way, eventually Oregon is going to have wolves in all places and the population will not continue to increase because there simply will be overlap between packs and they will there not be a bit an ability or space for more wolves to be there because they're territorial they have to fight over those resources with other packs and so packs will be smaller and they'll have smaller sizes 
And so if you think about it that way, eventually the population will absolutely plateau to a level number. And that's exactly what's happening in Northeast Oregon, where that level is starting to become not a strong population growth, but we're getting to a point where we have a lot of wolves in a lot of places and that population is gonna level off. The reason we see it leveling off on our statewide numbers is because most of the wolves are in Northeast. And so therefore it's gonna be heavily weighted towards Northeast. But we're gonna start seeing a lot more wolves over the next few years in other areas of Oregon and that population is gonna go up again. Thank you. Sure. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair Wall. Thank you, Roblin. Um, my question is about the maps because we didn't really get to see them quite properly. Uh, can you? What are the red lines? What? Uh, what was the? So the little trapezoid-looking things are like packs of wolves. The blue is where habitat supports them. And what's the red? What's the rest of it? Could you explain yeah. that to me? So the yellow is a polygon of an area of resident wolf activity. And so it could be a single wolf, it could be a pair of wolves, or it could be a pack, but it's resident wolf activity. And then the blue is the area of predicted suitable habitat for wolves. That's where we expect wolves to eventually be. Um, that's just predictions. It doesn't mean it's going to be absolutely right. And then the red line, I think you're talking about the, the solid red line that maybe goes through the center of this. Yep, that's the difference between the east and west wolf management zone. Maybe the, this thinner, one? the very thin red lines are highways. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. So the yellow line is the separation between east and west wolf management zone, and the okay. red line is simply highways, highways, just for guidance on where you are in a state. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's on to Derek. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, so uh, Brian and I are going to be talking about uh, now transitioning into the wolf plan. And I will hit on uh, the plan history and the current plan that we have today, and then Brian will get into our plan review. Next slide, please. It's the static, you yeah. know, the static is quite loud. Here we go. Thank you. Um, so to, to talk about the history of the Oregon Wolf Plan, it, it's I always enjoy talking about the full history. Um, so one of the biggest accomplishments that we have in this topic is that Oregon had a wolf plan in place before we had wolves reestablished. So the very first Oregon wolf conservation management plan was adopted in 2005 when we had zero wolves. Um, the plan was updated in 2010, um, but at that time we only had 21 wolves in the state. So there wasn't a whole lot to update because we didn't still yet have that much experience with wolf conservation and management in the state. Um, so by the time we came to the most recent update, which occurred in 2016 formally, we now at that point had 110 wolves. And so obviously going from 21 wolves to 110 wolves, there's quite a bit more information and experience that now lend themselves to provide that we're going to have a pretty substantial update of that wolf plan. That wolf plan formally began in 2016, a little bit started in 2015 as part of a state delisting analysis. Uh, and process, but it formally kicked off in 2016 and wrapped up in 2019. Next slide, please. Sure. Um, so this plan update was quite extensive. Um, as I mentioned, it began formally in 2016 and wrapped up in 2019, but it actually uh, got started earlier than that with as part of the, the state delisting process. So it was over three to four years in development. Um, it utilized a considerable number of staff and thousands and thousands of staff hours in that process. 
um, this also consisted of multiple commission meetings, public meetings, meetings with uh, interested parties, and uh, netted over 17,000 public comments um, that uh, yielded almost 1,000 pages of public comment, including over 13,000 or 15,000 uh, 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 email comments that had come in. Uh, so breaking down that that timeline a little bit. So we started in 2016. We had numerous commissioner meeting or commission meetings um, with a lot of public testimony and invited panels. Uh, as we moved into 2017, we started to have draft products out for comments and again, additional commission meetings and meetings with interested parties. Um, and at the end of 2017, we had a workshop much like this to go through a lot of the fine details. And following that workshop, there was direction to seek use of a facilitator to see if we can't find consensus on some of the final very contentious issues and so facilitator process got initiated in 2018 that was a pretty big effort hundred thousand dollar plus effort um, with ultimately 2019 being plan adoption in june again after additional group meetings so the goal of the oregon wolf conservation and management plan is really about conservation um, but really the only way to be successful in achieving that goal is to ensure that the social and economic interests of all Oregon, Oregonians are being addressed. Um, and so that really requires that there is a level of acceptance, tolerance, and buy-in in the plan's directives. Next slide, please. Um, coexistence being a major focus. As part of this plan update, uh, there were a number of guiding principles that were followed. Um, one was that we would be maintaining a conservation focus throughout all phases of the plan and utilizing all of the analyses conducted as part of the state delisting process. Um, we were also to address uh, workloads and uh, staff capacities as the workloads continued to grow enormously. But also at the same time, looking to increase and maintain uh, management flexibility, especially with growing numbers of animals. And so Ultimately, we ended up with a final product that better reflected the situations and the issues and concerns and successes of wolves in Oregon at that time. Uh, that plan was bolstered with a great deal now of Oregon information versus previously the plan was mostly based on information coming out of other Western states that had more experience with wolves, but now our plan actually reflected Oregon information. And this plan ultimately, um, while reflecting those current actions and understandings um, for wolf conservation management, it now serves as that foundation uh, as we go through this next phase of implementation. And so what's in the plan? Well, there's a lot. Um, there's 11 chapters, about 100 pages. There's another 50 pages of appendices. Uh, it's really all encompassing. And that was very much the approach was if there's anything relevant to wolf conservation management, it pretty much went into the plan. So there's information on a three phase approach and associated objectives. Uh, there's priorities listed there on monitoring and modeling, um, lists and concerns of conservation threats and issues and remedies, uh, provide a definition to the statutory definition of wolves in the state and talking about the tool of controlled take. Um, and then a lot of information on resolving conflict uh, with livestock, also concerns about wolf and ungulate interactions, um, and numerous other topics, including workload issues, research, et cetera. Next slide, please. So as I'm wrapping up here, talking about this plan, I think we'll be handing it off now to Brian to be talking about um, the plan review that just began here uh, early this year. Thanks, Derek. Um, I'll say next slide now. So Brian Wolfer, I'm the Wildlife Division Deputy Administrator. So. Um, I'm going to see if I can time my next slides to with the delays that we have it to see how things go. Um, so as, as you recall, uh, we talked to you back in April um, up in up in Welch's about the wolf plan review. And so we're the wolf plan review is a five year review and we're directed in both the wolf plan and the implementing uh, administrative rules to review this plan every five years. And that language says that the department is to review the plan and to bring before the commission uh, any recommendations for changes if we have them. Um, and we'll go ahead and hit next slide for um, my second one. 
What's that? <laughs> okay. Just keep going. We'll keep um, going. <laughs> yep. So so I'll keep talking. Perfect. So when we left in April, we immediately started our, our staff review of the Wolf Plan. And we started by assembling a team. And that team, uh, we tried to get some broad broad perspectives in the in the agency. So we included folks from wildlife division, from regions, from the wolf program, and from the field so that we had that full range from policy level to on the ground implementation level working on this plan. I'm gonna go ahead and say next slide, even though I'm not quite there yet. Um, and so the team started looking at the plan and they considered the entire thing, chapter by chapter, um, looked at the entire plan, and and we asked them to take that look from, you know, both that backwards look at the last five years, but then looking forward to the next five years, um, what are we going to need to to modify over the next five years, or how is this plan going to work um, in this forward looking timeline? And so there's a, a a number of components to that. One was looking at, and I got carried away with moving my slides ahead. So one was, are the plan objectives being met? How did we do meeting those objectives over the last five years? And then are they still relevant uh, as we move forward into that next five year period? Um, what did we learn over the last five years? And how does that knowledge and science gear us up towards making management decisions in the, in the future? And then really a look at how we've adapted our management. Um, in the past and then how we might need to adapt the management and does the plan give us the flexibility to do that adaptive management in the future. So as part of that and as part of our discussion in April, we recognize that we also needed to consider perspectives outside the agency. And so we had some um, outreach and we can move to the next slide. It's been pretty short, so you might hit next twice. Um, we knew we needed to get some of that outside perspective, and that was really an informal one-on-one. -on -one. And so individual members of the team met with people that we knew um, cared about the wolf plan. Um, they they live in country with wolves. They care about wolves. They're um, livestock producers. So we talked to hunters, um, conservation and um, wolf advocacy groups, uh, producers, uh, livestock committees, land managers, kind of a broad range of folks. And these discussions uh, are captured in our review. And so we've we've released our draft report and, and you've seen that draft report. And so you'll see in there um, reference to some of the things we're hearing about the, the plan. And that came from a lot of those discussions. So as we then look at, at what did we find with the plan, um, one, we found a number of areas where we did have some implement implementation success, and you heard some of that with Rob Lynn. We've we've seen expansion of the wolf range. We've seen some of the conservation threats we were worried about maybe downgrade a little bit. So as wolves have expanded, and we see wolves moving across state lines and are interconnected with other um, states in the Rocky Mountains, some of the concerns about uh, genetic diversity and genetic isolation are not what they were five years ago. Some of our concerns about um, disease, we're seeing that some of our wolves have had exposure to canine diseases and have survived and carry some of those titers. And so some of those unknowns that were conservation threats are not quite what they were five years ago. We also found places for potential updates to the plan. We've learned a lot of information in Oregon. There's information in other states. And so there's room uh, in the plan to make some updates to those um, and some other information uh, that could be shared. We also looked at adaptive management and we can probably hit next now. Um, and with adaptive management, there's a lot of places where we have adapted our management of wolves over the last five years. And there's a lot of places where we need to continue adapting that management. And so we need to continue to prioritize reducing um, human caused wolf mortality. We also have to continue to prioritize reducing livestock wolf conflict and depredation. Uh, we still have um, staff workload issues that we need to work on. Um, but we also find that there's room within this plan to meet some of that adaptive changes and there's elements of the plan that have not been implemented yet. And that includes things like 
in phase three, the plan recognizes that as the wolf population grows, doing a minimum count becomes um, becomes not the most efficient way to monitor a larger population than when you have a very small population. And so there's room within this plan to direct us to do some population modeling um, as we get into phase three, and we haven't implemented some of those things yet. So through this, um, as agency leadership, uh, we're, we're having conversations with other folks, and we were hearing a lot about desires from other groups to have um, have some conversations around the wolf plan. And so in, in kind of a pivot of what we had intended, the wolf plan review team uh, had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with a broad range of folks and his leadership, both in division, the regions and the director's office. Um, we had some purposeful discussions with some of the interested groups about wolves and the wolf plan itself. And, and a lot of our focus there was to to really listen. And so we spent a lot of time listening and then explaining what we saw in the plan and answering those questions about the implementation that we're doing, why we're doing that implementation, um, and talking about groups' perspectives of the plan. Uh, what we did not do is try to do any shuttle diplomacy, for lack of a better term. We did not say, well, these groups feel this way, how do you react to that? It was very much focused on what are what are your perspectives on this plan and and help us to understand that and and talking through that. So so those conversations are not not reflected in the team's draft report. Just want to make that clear that those conversations at our leadership level um, are not reflected like those one on one conversations that the team had with folks are are reflected in there. Um, so with that, like we're now we're now here with this workshop and we're looking at our next steps. We did see that there were areas of alignment um, with some of our conversations that we had with groups about the wolf plan um, and and next steps with the plan we we did see that there's some areas where there could be some updates but now we're also asking ourselves given that this plan is entirely uh, adopted into rule in its entirety um, are those potential changes um, going to add meaningful value to wolf management and and that's some of the um, some of the next steps for us uh, for discussion Thanks, Brian. Derek, I think we have a little bit of time for questions if you want to. OK, let me just check. Commissioners, any questions? I do have one, but if you want a second to think about it. Um, Brian, one of the things that has come up a couple times already today is the role of our department and the science. And a lot of this is resting here now for what's going on in Oregon. There's also the, the case that we look for not science from elsewhere so much as just look at what the expertise is out there and bringing that in so that we open ourselves up and look at these questions. And one of them that you, one of the issues you mentioned that I would like you to, if you will, just comment briefly on the role of our department bringing in the science is on the question about moving from minimum count, for instance, to modeling instead. How broadly do we kind of put that out there and test those, those ideas? Thank you, Chair Wall. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think maybe I'm going to start by saying that, yeah, as we look at the new science and what's out there, we recognize that anytime we put together a plan and we put in that plan what the current knowledge is, the next month it's a little bit outdated because some new paper gets published and we're always um, taking that into account because um, we know that we can't capture everything and so we try to stay up on what the new science is and that factors into our decision making and we never expect the plan to contain every last piece um when it comes to modeling i think there's a lot of questions about what like what we as an agency can pull off in terms of monitoring strategies so there's a lot of budget and personnel questions that go into it um, at this point we're so in our um, infancy stage on modeling that we're starting to have some conversations with some outside biometrician experts, um, with some 
kind of consulting uh, businesses to look at uh, what might work for us. We know that using something off the shelf in a state that has different habitat types, different terrains, different numbers of wolves isn't necessarily going to work for us. And so we're going to have to look at what could work for us and then what data is going to have to feed that and whether or not we can pull that off and make that work. And so we're very much at the infancy stage, and I think there's a lot of room to talk to partners about that. Um, at the same time, um, there's going to have to be some agency decision and priority about those staffing and budgets to pull things off. And we can't always do things uh, in exactly the way that that others would like it done in a perfect funding world. Thank you. That actually helps. If there's anything else. If not, let's go right on to the next. If I could, one more thing that as we were trying to stay ahead of the slides, I, I didn't mention. Um, you know, with those conversations we had with other groups, um, we heard a lot of the same topics, but from different perspectives. And that did lead to the form format of this um, workshop. Um, with, within that draft report, we're not trying to tally up everything we've heard because we know that as staff, we can't capture what's behind everybody's input. And so, um, we thought it was important that we bring in some of those um, outside perspectives and let let you all hear directly from those folks instead of having us try to summarize some of those thoughts. Great, thank you. Thanks, Brian. So while there are a lot of things that are going quite well in terms of wolf management, there are some pain points and our review highlighted the, these pain points and our discussions with the parties highlighted these pain points too. So we wanted to dive into these in a little bit more detail um, with panels so that you could hear the perspectives on these topics. And the first one here is around implementation of the plan in Northeast Oregon. And the issue there really centers around wolf livestock conflict. And this is an issue that we really have to resolve if we want to be successful going forward in other areas of the state as well as Northeast Oregon. So we're going to start off with a, um, just some information from Holly. She's going to share some information on depredation that can inform the discussion following that. And then we're going to dive into the panel discussions. So I'll turn it over to you, Holly. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Holly Tours Lance. I'm the Northeast Oregon Regional Wolf Biologist based out of Enterprise. Um, so I'm going to discuss wolf plan implementation as it relates to wolf livestock conflict. I'm going to give you a brief overview of depredations, highlighting some of what we've learned in Northeast Oregon as well as other parts of the state. Um, but before I dive in, I'd like just to acknowledge that for those individuals experiencing conflict, it is a physically, emotionally, and personally trying experience. The monetary loss, the additional time and energy requirements, and the overall stress to producers can be overwhelming. Uh, next slide. So not only is wolf livestock conflict a challenge to wolf management, it is also a critical component to ensuring the long-term conservation of wolves. Uh, so the next slide is going to show a statewide look at the last 13 years um, from 2009 to 2022. Uh, it doesn't include 2023. And you'll see six highlighted counties, um, which account for 90% of all confirmed depredations in the state, hopefully. Say that again, six counties have what percentage? Uh, so six counties have accounted for 90% of all confirmed depredations in the state, and that's over 13 years across the state. So now you can see it's not those highlighted in red on the map, and you can advance to the next slide, please. So the next slide is going to show just Northeast Oregon. So the four counties, uh, Union, Umatilla, Wallowa, and Baker. Um, it's gonna be data for just 2022, and it's gonna show that 32 individual producers that year experienced confirmed depredations. Of those 32, eight experienced two or more depredations, while the other 24 experienced one confirmed depredation for the whole year. So that is consistent with our statewide 13 year analysis, which found that annually 65% of livestock producers that experienced a single depredation event did not experience any additional depredations within the same calendar year. Our 13 year analysis also found that 10 producers accounted for 35% of all depredations statewide over that 13 year time span.
Yeah, which part? I know. Like... We're... Okay. Yeah, I can I can say that again. So this map is 2022 data. Um, what you see in red orange is areas WMUs that where producers experienced more than one confirmed depredation. The yellow is just one. Um, so for 2022, 32 producers experienced confirmed depredations that year. Yeah, so a WMU is a wildlife management unit. That's your hunting unit. Um, so this is broken down into small parts of those four counties that I mentioned. And then, so for that year, of the 32, eight producers experienced half of all the known depredations. So that's two or more. And then 24, the other 24, um, only experienced one depredation for that year. And that's consistent with our 13-year analysis that found that 65% of producers on an annual basis experienced one confirmed depredation event for that year. And then that 13-year analysis also found that 10 producers accounted for 35% of all depredations statewide. So we can identify that there's 10 producers out there that are experiencing the most conflict. So why are some areas more prone to conflict than others? There's no one answer. It's likely a combination of factors. Some possible explanations include wolf territorial overlap with cattle. So as available habitat is being filled in, New wolf packs are forced into occupying more marginal habitats and may encounter livestock more often. Natural prey availability and vulnerability is another factor. For example, we know that depredations occur most frequently in the spring. This is due to the fact that calves are most vulnerable and available prey on the landscape at that time. Calves are typically turned out early in the spring prior to the birth of wild prey, which exposes them to a greater risk of depredation. And then in some... So a depredation is when a livestock producer encounters a dead calf on the landscape and calls us and asks for an investigation. We investigate that as a depredation, which is essentially instead of predation where wolves kill elk, it's wolves are killing livestock. That's a depredation. Yes, you're welcome. Um, in some circumstances, the behavior of packs can shift over time where negative encounters with livestock can become habitual. Uh, such as the rogue pack, which I'm going to discuss in a minute. And producer actions such as removing attractants and using deterrence methods can also influence the likelihood of conflict occurring. So all this information and knowledge of where these conflict prone areas are allows us to proactively focus our resources and assistance to those individuals experiencing the conflict. This focused approach could significantly help reduce and prevent future life wolf livestock conflict. Next slide, please. So how do we address conflict? In all situations, the proper use and implementation of deterrence methods that are appropriate for the given situation is encouraged and required if lethal removal is to be considered. Conflict that persists even with the proper implementation of these tools can be addressed with lethal removal in the one third of the state where this tool is available. Next slide. In the Western Wolf Management Zone, where lethal removal has not been an option due to the ESA listing status of wolves in that part of the state, the rogue pack has been in a state of chronic depredation status for a number of years. This pack is responsible for 61 confirmed depredations from 2016 to 2022, which equates to nearly half of all confirmed depredations in the West Wolf Management Zone. While producers have used a number of various deterrence methods and agency partners such as wildlife services have tried new technology in an effort to decrease the depredations, wolf livestock conflict with this pack has persisted. Not having lethal removal as an option has had a negative impact on social tolerance, which can be counterproductive to the conservation of this species. Had lethal removal been an option, removal of the rogue pack may not have only prevented numerous depredations, but provided relief to producers and staff who have devoted unsustainable amounts of time to trying to prevent conflict. Next slide. Holly, while you're waiting for the next slide, could I, a quick question. I have, I have been assuming 
that it's almost exclusively cattle, and that's the way you've talked about it. Do you, do you have any idea how many other livestock besides cattle are affected? Yeah, so these numbers aren't just cattle. This is just confirmed depredation. So it's cattle, sheep, goats, anything that qualifies under that definition. But when you talk about it, you talk about almost exclusively cattle. So is it mostly, I mean, it's mostly cattle. Yes. Do you have any idea what the percentage is or? I can look that up for you and get okay. you that number. Yes, I do have that number, just not off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Yep. So um, putting it back, putting it into perspective, based on our data, on average, 62% of known wolves or packs aren't known to depredate annually. So more simply put, not all wolves are involved in depredation. All this being said, wolf livestock conflict is a serious challenge and one that we are committed to proactively addressing. Later today, you're gonna to hear from Nick Myatt and others on all the recent and upcoming efforts that have been undertaken to address this issue. But right now, Sean's gonna introduce the panel. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, so in an effort to um, address some of the technology issues we're having, Michelle and, and Roxy are going to try and uh, load the presentation directly onto this so we can advance here and then they'll live stream over here. Um, so they'll be setting that up while we're having the panel discussion. Um, but right now we'd like to transition into that panel discussion. I think we're going to start with John from Oregon Cattlemen. And uh, I think, John, we'd like to hear your perspective on this issue of wolf livestock conflict in Northeast Oregon. Um, and just kind of briefly share with the commission your thoughts on that. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> you said I'm John Williams. I'm the co-chair of the Wolf Committee for the Oregon Cattlemen's Association, and I'm here today representing the Oregon Cattlemen's Association. Impacts of the presence of wolves on ranchers is focused on depredation losses, which is a, which are substantial and can cause significant impact on the bottom line of the ranchers. However, other costs related to the wolves are substantially underestimated. The increased costs associated with physical stress of the cattle and management costs to the producers and more significantly than are more significant than the, than the actual death. In fact, non-lethal costs and the increased management costs are as large or larger than any depredation costs. The list of costs includes depredations, reduced weight gain of calves, weight loss from cows, conception rate reduction from cows, and then management cost increases. The first four are production uh, costs, which cause loss of income. Um, the last is management costs, encompasses a large group of issues that cause increased cost to production. Management issues can be broken down into costs of implementing non-lethal activities at a to attempt to mitigate the impact of the wolf presence, management costs through the implementation of government regulations and the implementation of the wolf plan, increased cost to livestock handling and range management, increased cost through injury and death to livestock, and the loss of the range access because of the wolf presence in given places, it's just not smart to put your run your cattle in those specific areas. I can't leave off the emotional loss or the emotional cost it's causing ranchers. The fact of dealing with the kill sites that sometimes is a horrific, uh, are horrific, the time away from the family for implementing non-lethal and economic stress all compounds the already long hours it takes to run a ranch. The wolf is taking the ranch style away from many ranchers. Next, I wanna talk make an offer some thoughts on how the wolf management is going in the rancher's perspective. Prior to July, wolf management was cumbersome, slow to implement, and was not in any way at the level it was needed to control uh, the wolf conflict in, in most situations. This continued to eliminate many chance for ranchers to have any social tolerance for wolves. Since July, of this year, we've seen changes in the management have helped resolve at least some of those issues. We're seeing wolf investigations being done in a more timely manner. We've seen lethal take permits with more appropriate restrictions that have allowed for them to be fully uh, be fulfilled in an efficient manner. We can talk more detail later if you'd like. Uh, we are encouraged by the direction. We're encouraged by the appropriateness of the recent action. These quicker actions will be better for the ranchers better for the wolves, as over time, we should reduce wolf livestock conflict occurring as long as these management activities continue. Current management is increasing the social tolerance of ranchers 
who have though of those who have experienced it. We've been sharing the changes with ranchers in our meetings this fall. It was our focus of the Oregon Cattlemen's Association Wolf Committee uh, at the annual meeting and a variety of other meetings. We look forward to the time we have for proper wolf management that produces less conflict as wolves who live and stay away from conflict are allowed to breed. And those that come in to come in and get in trouble will be lethally removed. Over time, this should begin to produce a balance needed between wolves and livestock production, where there is an appropriate wolf population in locations where wolf livestock conflict are at a minimum. This will be good for the livestock producer and good for the wolves. And by the way, we don't want to forget the ever increasing damage occurring to the state wildlife populations. Two other comments. It's the wolf conservation and management plan. I've heard a couple of people talk about it as the wolf conservation plan. And it's we are in phase three east of the cat east of Highway 395. And that's where the management needs to be time for an emphasis on the management. Carter Niemeyer, years ago, when we first had wolves introduced into Idaho, we had a meeting in Enterprise because Mac Berkmeyer was concerned about it in 1996. And Carter Niemeyer came in and he said, wolves need two things. They need an adequate undulant base and we need tolerant people. And the cattle industry is part of that undulant base. And we appreciate the efforts that are being made at the present time to move in trying to resolve those conflicts. However, we will have and do have more people dealing with more wolves in more places in Oregon than ever right now. So it, it needs to continue. And but we are very encouraged by what we've seen with the wolf management since July. I'll stop with that. John, we may come back with quick questions, but we were going to go through. I'll be I'll be here. Yeah, okay, thank you. Go ahead, John. Thanks, John. Um, so yeah, John kind of alluded to six months ago um, being a bit of a turning point, and I just want to underline that prior to that, things were in a pretty, pretty bad place, um, both from a staff workload perspective and from a rela relationship perspective. And it's really important for us to think about how we're going to turn that around, how we have been turning it around, because it's by doing that that we're going to address the staff burnout, um, staff workload, as well as um, put ourselves on a productive pathway towards uh, coexistence of wolves and livestock in Oregon. So we're really focusing in on this, and this is why we're having this panel discussion. I think next up we wanted to hear from uh, Oregon Hunters Association. I think Mike is going to be taking that. Good afternoon, Mike Toady. I'm the Conservation Director. Thank you, Brian, uh, with the Oregon Hunters Association here. I'm going to uh, just briefly talk about two different perspectives sure. from from OHA here. Uh, one is kind of our current priorities, and and then second, and to follow up with kind of concern levels that we have right now. And some of the stuff you've kind of heard or alluded to already, so it should be aligned pretty well. So our overarching goal is to have a well-managed wolf population in Oregon, and, and that definition, you could talk to different people and come up with different responses about what well-managed is, but I think the agency's done a good job of capturing some of those points there and understanding that we need to be able to address bad actors and still look to wolf conservation and think about wolf expansion through the rest of the state occurring here. So, so one of our current priorities here, it was alluded to here earlier, was uh, the development of a defensible population model. And one of the most contentious things we see is, is this use of minimum wolf counts right now. And, and as we talked about earlier, wolves are expanding. They've kind of moved beyond that point. The agency has begun talking about that, and that still uh, will and continue to be a priority to us in terms of this evolution of wolf management there. A key part of that will be a comprehensive monitoring program that's also discussed in this review that you've seen here. Um, without good data, population models are difficult and challenging enough, uh, particularly with smaller population levels, you're gonna have wider confidence intervals and some things like that. So picking that right tool in the right place, the right model um, to really help depict the, the full wolf picture in Oregon is gonna be instrumental for us. 
when we start talking about comprehensive monitoring program, one of the things we'd like to touch on is the use, potential use of citizen science there. That's talked about in the current plan as well. And so if we have credible and reliable sources of information and in monitoring wolf presence, wolf distribution areas, uh, we'd like to see that included in those conversations and those inputs. Um, obviously, one of the next thing uh, representing a hunting organization, one of our next priorities is really to continue to work on really understanding better what the true effects of the another apex predator in Oregon is having on our ungulate mm -hmm. populations there. Um, there's work underway already from Dr. Clark. OHA has been continuing to support that. But as we look across the state, wolves continue to expand. Um, understanding those relationships, predator prey models are key for a couple of reasons. They're key from us and, and the, the agency did a nice job of touching on the importance of wildlife ungulate populations to not just hunters, but everybody here in Oregon, that continues to be a priority. But there is information out there that shows is if, if our wild population, our wild prey populations are reduced, those wolves need to continue to eat and they're gonna to turn to a different source of food there and, and perhaps exacerbate an already challenged situation. So um, we agree with that statement of ensuring that wolves and ungulates are managed to avoid negative impacts to both. That's a challenge, right? And, but uh, we live in, the, we're here in America, right? So we want our cake and we wanna eat it too, right? So, but uh, it's a balance. Those things are gonna ebb and flow across times with predator prey models there. We're just concerned that we want to have the tools in place and a process in place that should we start to see a verifiable serious decline in ungulate populations that we have the tools and we're ready to, to make and address that situation. There. So. Last one I want to talk about in terms of our current priorities here has to do with the uh, around controlled take. Uh, controlled take is, is outlined quite well in the current plan there and we believe that uh, we should be examining the use of damage hunts um, in addressing controlled take here in Oregon. There's two different scenarios where controlled take would be allowed. One is under chronic livestock depredation. I think you've already heard about that. And the second goes back to what I just talked about where we have um, responses or, or predation levels rather on wildlife populations that are unacceptable or bring us out of balance. Uh, the key thing I would like to just touch on with that is all these priorities are all within the existing framework of the plan. We don't need to rewrite a plan to do that. All those things are there. It's a matter of implementation there. So that leads me to uh, a few of the concerns that OHA has at this point in time. The first I would capture, and perhaps this is one of the biggest ones, has to do with agency bandwidth. And, and there's two perspectives on that. And we've heard from the from staff here already that there's uh, they've struggled at times with the workloads that are out there. And so I would just offer to start with, think about in uh, when Derek talked about in 2005 with the writing of the first plan, there were no verified wolves in Oregon at that point in time. And you think about what your field staff was doing at that point in time. And, and I doubt very seriously the district biologists at that point in time were looking around for something to do. They had a full plate of work as it was. Now, as we look at the current situation today, some of those field staff, 20 to 30 percent of their time is being spent on wolf and wolf related issues. That's not something they had to deal with before. And so we're asking the question about if that's the case, what's come off their plate and how's that affecting other capacities, other wildlife programs in the state? And that's a concern for us. The next part has to do with the specific staff that's dedicated to working around wolf, wolf depredation issues and plan implementation. We feel like we've been behind the power curve on that all along. And while recently you heard John uh, mention that that situation has changed, we've had some capacity through other agencies and some things like that. I think at the rate that we're seeing wolves continue to disperse and populate other places of the state, we're, we're already behind the power curve in terms of staffing levels there, in terms of field staff able to address those things and staff able to continue to work on plan implementation and those things that I mentioned before as priority. So um, bandwidth is, is almost always an issue at some point in time for programs and stuff. We're gonna continue to support those things, whether it's additional agency staff or additional cooperator agency participation in these things. 
Um, I, I can't. Uh, also, I would say, you know, clearly for, for OHA, um, the illegal take of wolves and organs is, is, is something of concern for us. OHA doesn't condone any sort of poaching for any wildlife in Oregon, and, and that includes wolves and that situation. And we'd like to, once again, there's probably a capacity issue there with enforcement and some other things there. So with that, um, I can kind of wrap up my comments and leave it for questions later. Thanks, Mike. I think we wanted to move now to the last panelist, uh, Shristi, who's going to share her perspectives and uh, the group's perspectives on the kind of issues in Northeast Oregon. I hope this works. Um, Chair Wall and members of the commission, uh, my name is Dr. Srishti Kamal, and I'm the Deputy Director at Western Environmental Law Center, a public interest environmental law firm working to protect public lands, waters, and wildlife. <clears throat> I do want to recognize at the onset here that everyone here, including ODFNW and others on this panel, want the same thing, which is less conflict, because it means that less dead livestock, which means less dead wolves. We just differ on how we think we can get there. I will start with a big picture context between the last revision and the current one, and it might look slightly different from ODFNW's perspective. Um, in the last five years, we've seen a steady decline in population growth rate for wolves in Oregon, and it has practically stagnated in the last two years with less than 2% per year growth rate. Wolf deaths, on the other hand, have increased significantly, and that might have something to do with the leveling in the growth curve curve as well. This year is especially disheartening in terms of wolf deaths. So far, we have 19 death, dead wolves in this year that we know of. Of the 19, 16 were killed by ODFNW. We never know the exact number of poaching cases caught in the act or wolves killed in highway collision till the April report comes out, so the number might be higher. Additionally, we are geared up to send 10 wolves to Colorado. We, of course, support the reintroduction efforts, but it means another 10 wolves gone from Oregon, bringing the total wolves lost to 29 out of 178. So if you're following my math, we have lost at least 16% of our population in a single year. The average growth rate being at 1.5% the past couple of years, so just by applying logic, you can anticipate a decline in wolf population this year for the first time since wolves made it back to Oregon. The 16 wolves killed by ODFNW are a result of execution of lethal permits in response to wolf livestock conflict. If you think about it a little, the minimum count has been more or less the same for two years, but the conflicts have increased. Issuing of lethal permits in response have increased, resulting in more dead wolves, and yet conflicts continue to persist. I will use the example of Lookout Mountain Pack in Baker County as an example from 2021. In that year, the pack was responsible for multiple predation incidents and ODFNW killed multiple wolves in response, including three-month-old pups. ODFNW reasoned that the pack was predating because of the pup's caloric needs, a theory that has no basis in any peer-reviewed literature that I am aware of. The department killed two Lookout Mountain wolves in August. Predation continued. They killed three more in September. Predation continued. Then they killed three more in October, and October marked the end of the grazing season and put an end to this cycle. In this case, and in many cases we have seen in Oregon and other places, lethal control has been unsuccessful in addressing conflict long term. There is a great volume of scientific literature that tells us killing wolves in response to conflict does not solve the problem in the long run, and it does not build social tolerance for the species. Who you kill in the pack also matters about how the pack reacts afterward, and in most situations conflict persists or stops for a short time before it comes back. It feels like we are refusing to listen to the best available science here. We will continue to advocate for non-lethal tools and low-stress livestock husbandry practices and applying them in Oregon's context. Using the right tool at the right place and the right time matters. Otherwise, it feels like the, in, we are feeding into the narrative that non-lethals don't work. Examples of successful non-lethal tools and low-stress animal husbandry practices exist in literature, and it also exists in the Northern Rockies and in our own backyard in Baker County. I would like to go back to the example of the Lookout Mountain conflict from 2021, because 2021 was also a severe drought year in Eastern Oregon. That can affect prey behavior such as elk and deer on the landscape. While wolves tend to stick to their territory, denning site and rendezvous sites, their more mobile prey can move in search of cooler temperature and water, leaving wolves and cattle on the landscape. There is also another example of the Chesnimnus pack from 2022 in Wallawa County in April, 
the same month that Wallawa saw atypical snowstorms. This meant grass and forest that cattle and ungulates would generally eat were limited to areas where they would all coexist. But the only group with young ones were cattle, and calves were the ones the wolf predated. These are examples unfolding in front of our eyes if we choose to study and use the information to do better. This is where I would like to distinguish between conservation and management plan. This plan is heavily focused on management, how to control rather than conserve. It does not spend any time or resource to understand other issues, including climate change impacts and other variables, and adapt accordingly. Rarely has it been that the same pack is responsible for multiple predations year after year. Understanding the causes can help anticipate, prepare, and plan better. So perhaps another panel today could have been that of scientists who have devoted their careers studying these issues. So managers like ODF and W can use that information and have better management strategies. Uh, going back to the conversations we've had with ODF and W at a more granular level, I, along with three other conservation groups, met with uh, several ODF and W staff in the last couple of months to identify specific areas of improvement. Um, and I'll only very briefly mention them here uh, as recommendations under three broad buckets. The first bucket is implementation, standardization, and reporting on non-lethals. In this bucket, we tried to highlight some of the current challenges in standardization of non-lethal tools. We also discussed ODFNW's recent change in sharing investigation reports on their website, which has become significantly less transparent and erodes trust. Therefore, our recommendations were develop standard practices for range riding and human presence, conduct pilot studies on efficacy of non-lethals depending on size and nature of operation and terrain, physical verification of non-lethals by ODFNW in case of predation events, and share transparent and detailed information on investigation reports like the agency used to, which builds public trust and gives us research data on the circumstances of predation incidents. The next bucket was around the execution of lethal permits. Yeah. Lower. OK. Just trying to be mindful of the time. Thank you, Commissioner. Take notes and capture what you're saying. In your, Absolutely. In your Thank you, Commissioner. Kind of important thing. Absolutely. Um, the next bucket is around the execution of lethal removal permits. The agency used to issue 30 days lethal permits, which have now increased to up to 100 days. This goes against their own assumptions on the effectiveness of lethal control or the lack thereof. If you kill a wolf and you don't have to wait long enough to see if it made any difference before you kill another wolf, how is the agency testing its own assumptions? We recommend bringing the permit down to 30 days again with the possibility of reissuing it. We didn't think that it needed to be spelled out that pups should not be included in a lethal permit because they do not participate in a hunt, but the last four years have told us otherwise. We now recommend that pups or any individuals that jeopardize the survival of pups in a pack should not be included in the execution of a permit. Based on the experiences of the last few years, we also recommend that ODF and W maintain some agency over the number of designated agents a producer can have, and that ODF and W should receive a list of producer designated agents covered by the permit at the beginning of a permit's issuance. The final bucket is related to wildlife services role. Wildlife services has a history of efficient wildlife killing, sometimes inhumanly, and sometimes resulting in the death of non-target species. They are also a black box of information. It is very hard to get data from them. With wildlife services now set to have an active role in investigations and in killing wolves, we ask that ODFNW remain the main body of information holder such that investigation reports and lethal permit execution reports can be shared with the public because ODFNW is holding it. Transparency and accountability will go a long way in easing this otherwise very concerning transition. We'd also like to discuss the impact of other non-lethal or impact on other non-lethal tools and strategies now that ODFNW has increased capacity and resources in the form of wildlife services. Those are our three big buckets, and there's a lot of finer details and nuances that I had to leave out today. Uh, but I would like to conclude with the very simple reflection that wolves are a territorial species. So once you have a pack near your allotment or your land, they tend to keep other wolves out. It is about figuring out how to coexist with the pack you have and not all wolves in Oregon. Thank you.
Thanks, uh, Shristi, and thank you to all the panelists for sharing your perspectives here. And I think I'll turn it back to to Chair Wall and the Commission. Yes, there are just a couple questions. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, there, there, I thought I had heard all of this, but there were a couple new ones even in this in today. So thank you for the information, Commissioners. Do we have questions immediately? Yeah, Dr. King. You don't have a mic for darling. Thank you. Thank you to all. Um, my question is, I think maybe to Mike and John, but I, can you explain, like, we, I hear a lot that it's time to allow for a controlled hunt for wolves. Can you tell me, like, do you want that in addition to what Wildlife Services is doing in terms of their increasing presence or not? And, and is there an overlap there? Are they the same? I, I just don't quite understand what, what exactly you think either or both will do. Well, I, I'll launch on it and then John can follow up there. So what I discussed here today, uh, Commissioner King was was around the, the concept of damage hunting. And damage hunting is not specifically a controlled hunt. Okay. So damage hunt is a very specific purpose. It's a tool in the toolbox there. It doesn't preclude the use of other tools and it shouldn't be the only tool you use. But it's something that we haven't considered at this point. And I think there's some evidence in other states where damage hunting has been used to help alleviate depredation of livestock uh, while still not uh, mm -hmm. declining any habitat or rather population levels of wolves. So we've seen that in both Idaho and Montana where that's been used. So it, just remember that a damage hunt is specific to areas of damage. And that would be outlined that way in terms of time, space, Permits, things of that nature there, and it's not necessarily a controlled hunt. Okay, controlled thank you. Hunt by the traditional thinking of where I would apply for an elk egg and a controlled right. unit, that type of thing. Those are two different things. Okay, no, that's fine. Thank you for clarifying. But I guess I still don't understand. Isn't that what the range riders do? So, if I might, um, the range riders are there for to implement non-lethal, and if they are working. If they're not working, particularly for the ranchers, they many times are restricted from being able to actually control the wolves. Uh, I think it's more an issue of time, timing, and the speed at which, and, and, and then the scale of which things can be done. So when we talk about an action of su something such as a lethal take permit, the things that we saw change drastically in the in the summer that we are appreciative about is that before that there would be one wolf or two wolves that would be allowed and you could take them in for 30 days and they could only be on a 1200 acre pasture which by the way a wolf can cross in about five minutes and then you you were limited as to which wolves you could take in the pack and prior to last july there was only two wolves ever taken by ranchers on lethal take permits. Uh, the rest of them had all been taken by ODF and W or other agents. Uh, so the very, very low success rate, which meant we did a lot of effort without success. When we changed uh, directions where they were offering two, three or more wolves at a time, uh, a full ranch area or two ranches, if both ranches are being hit, and then that it could be, um, we could use wildlife services, they could trap, uh, and that they weren't saying only take the certain individuals out of the pack, but the pack had gotten in trouble, so the pack was being able to be taken. Uh, every time we've done that, we've killed those wolves in less than two weeks. So so that lethal control meant lethal control, and it, and it got done relatively quickly. It was good for the rancher, that was good for the ODFW staff, time, and money. Uh, and, and, and in my mind, when you stop depredation in this manner, uh, those wolves that are left, if they're not depredating, then they're left alone. And to me, that's that concise and, and decisive decision making and then follow through is good for the wolves as well. And not those necessarily that died, but the, but the rest of the pack, which is what we're managing. So. That's what, when I talk about time to get on with management, that's what I'm talking about is the time and the scale. And I, if I could, I didn't talk about my two papers that I handed to you people that's there because I just 
didn't want to take the time to do it, but that's the cattlemen's list of priority things they'd like to talk about in both management and in the wolf plan. And then the other is further explanation on the economic losses due to the presence of wolves. So thank you. Okay, thank you. I think you both in a way have answered my question in that we've improved and now wildlife services can act more definitively, which I don't then see the need for a damage hunt. Is, am I understanding what to me a are? damage hunt would be even less expensive okay. and more efficient and less time staff time I, I just we're, we need to normalize wolves and we need to get the 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 wolf management uh to where it is in a timely manner and it's done efficiently with lower staff time lower lower budget time for them and a better outcome for the ranchers and okay. for the wildlife that's Okay, thank you. And that's a segue into my next question. And it doesn't have to be the panelists that answered. Maybe the staff can join in as well. And something that I brought up a lot, um, you guys are probably sick of me, me saying it, but the effect on staff that this has, the effect on morale, the effect of what has happened to the enterprise office, how we've had this cycle of people go through, because many of you have mentioned, we've dumped this huge workload onto already a full-time job. What are we doing to address that and not just replacing the positions that, you know, have been vacant or acting or whatever they are? Are we actually getting more positions? Are we funding this properly? Because, you know, I talk a lot in my professor role about like epigenetics and intergenerational trauma and like what what long term stressors actually does to people physiologically. And so are we dealing with that in any real way as an agency? Because I think that feeds into all of this, is making all of this spin. So uh, Commissioner King, I, I have a whole presentation this afternoon where I'm gonna lay out everything we're doing, but there's one, one piece I'd like to touch on now. Uh, you mentioned like additional staff and more capacity. And as, as you look at uh, the history of wolf plan implementation since wolves returned to Oregon, uh, we originally started by increasing, you know, we just had one one Roblin at the time, and then we went to two Roblins, and then, well, you could never have two Roblins, but had two wolf biologists, and then we went to uh, three additional regional wolf biologists. We kept, as wolves expanded in population and range, we kept expanding capacity, uh, but we're, we're at a point now where, you know, where wolves have covered, you know, a lot of the state and growing. And we can't always keep growing and adding more positions and more capacity. So uh, a lot of what we're looking at also is how do we get more efficient and how do we get uh, very focused with where we spend that capacity that we we do have. Um, but if if I could, I'd like to this afternoon my presentation will lay out kind of a lot of um, what we're doing and have done and where we're going with addressing the staff workload and some of those other issues. I, I would just like to say that the changes that we've seen since July has significantly improved the opportunity for social tolerance you, in, in, with ranchers. You don't get that quickly, but it's the start. And it's it's optimistic in my mind that when we uh, if we continue this direction, it will have a significant impact on the people like the staff and in, in enterprise uh, on a positive manner. I, I really think that may be the key of what we're doing different with our management. Yep. Uh, thank you, Chair Wall. So um, before I get to my question, I just have one question for the panelists. But before I do that, <clears throat> I think it needs to be said that. Um, it needs to be a big thank you to Brian, um, to Debbie, uh, to Derek, um, to Sean, um, and others that I may have missed for your, uh, who did I miss? Nick, excuse me, <laughs> for, for, for you folks sitting down and having these meetings with the various interest groups uh, to listen. Um, I think that deserves a pat on the back uh, to hear what they have to say. I very much appreciate that. And then also I want to uh, thank Sristi, Danielle, um, John, uh, Amy Patrick from OHA, and um, 
state police for meeting with me personally and talking about some of the issues that you had. I, I very much appreciate that. Um, hopefully I listened and captured some of the ideas and I'll have some significant questions for staff later on. But the question I want to ask is um, on page two or on page one of the of the overview that the department I'm going to read uh, directly. Um, this review found a plan provides substantial flexibility to adapt to new or growing challenges. While many portions of the plan could benefit from an update with new information, this review finds few of any significant modifications that are needed for the plan to be able to address contemporary needs and continue to successfully guide wolf conservation and management in Oregon. So see, I'm going to read one other pot spot here. So uh, in my conversations with just these advocate groups on both sides of the wolf plan issues over the last few weeks, there appears, and this is me talking now, there appears to be some guarded consensus that the wolf plan itself does not need major revisions as the plan was crafted with adaptive management in mind to implement plan details. And what I've heard, most of the issues, concerns that you have raised can be addressed with current plan with some improved interpretations or clarifications as a result of multiple meetings that both sides have had and continue to have with staff. My question um, is the following. Uh, given that you are all professionals and that you have significant experience on working with difficult issues to resolve difficult issues, I'm going to ask the following question. Um, is my assumption correct on the part that and what I've heard most of the issues and concerns raised can be addressed with current plan with some improved interpretations or clarification as a result of these multiple meetings that both sides have had and continue to have with staff. Is this a correct assumption on my part? And I fully realize the devil's in the detail. So Maybe Shristi, I'll ask you first. Sure, Commissioner Labhart, I can I can kick it off. Um, I'm going to give a very yes and no answer to that. Sorry about that. But um, the reason being that, yes, if we're talking about the very core elements of the plan, such as standards and phases, not, none of us are maybe talking about that. But the detail is in the fact that the plan derives its implementation and we are having issues with implementation. So unless we figure out a way to codify those implementation challenges in a way in the plan um, that it's captured and stays consistent, even if we have staff turnover at ODFNW, so that we don't maybe we don't have Sean and Brian to have this conversation again five years later, that things don't change because it was not written down in words in the wolf plan. So that's that's my reason of saying a yes and no because the issues are yes related to the implementation but the plan drives the implementation so unless we figure out a way to have those implementation challenges codified by some other mechanism and i might look at odf and w for that um we would like to have some of those added in the plan okay danielle do you agree <laughs> yeah okay okay thank you john The answer, the short answer is yes, with a qualification. Short term, yes. Um, long term, our vision that we need is, and you'll hear it again and again, we need to normalize wolves. And we need to be going, moving to pro proactive management. And that proactive management is, is, is a big leap inside of this plan. I don't know that that means that in the next few years that we're going to get far enough in, into the management to get to proactive management. So my qualification is I have problems with the implementation as well, but that's not that's not the plan. I can live with the plan short term. And recognizing that we've got to get to proactive management sooner than later. Mike. Yeah, you, I can just reiterate, Commissioner. What I said before, all those priorities that I listed are current priorities are all within the bounds of the current plan. Yeah. It's really about uh, pace of implementation is, is the key thing for us. I think if we're able to get some of those things done that I discussed earlier, that lays the groundwork for a progression to the next one. 
start to look at wolves differently and manage them like every other game animal. Okay, thank you. We stop with those speakers, please. <laughs> My tolerance is at an end with the static and squeaking or whatever they're doing. Can we just turn them off? <laughs> on the 10 percent and I think it's probably a question but um, there was a discussion about 10 percent and I think you said and Molly 10 percent of the species 35 percent of the living dealt with it differently um, it won't have a fix in what happens if that's a subscribing number and I've already known so is there a difference in the way people experience the answer? So uh, I guess this doesn't do anything. No. Yeah, <laughs> it's off. Uh, so I, I, I want to make sure first I um, understand your question and also understand the statistics. So I, I think what uh, what Holly was saying is that of the producers that have experienced damage or uh, a depredation, 10% of those or some. What, OK, what? so that statistic was 13 over 13 years, yep. 10 particular producers, not 10%, 10 okay. individuals um, experienced 35% of all depredations that occurred for those 13 years. So 35% is a pretty significant number for those 10 producers. Yeah. And that was kind of the take home message we were trying to present is there there is a very small number of producers that are experiencing very significant loss and and what that means for us and is our take home is we can really put a lot of you know not just we us our partners can put a lot of resources towards helping those producers and really have a large amount of impact in addition to helping all all producers with that and to me, that's uh, my, I, I hate to keep referencing this presentation we get later today, but we have a whole lot of uh, resources coming. And I think that's what's going to help guide prioritization of those and where, what have we learned over the last number of years and where we can really target that to have the, the biggest impact. And just what you answered, you did answer a lot of it for me. And I sorry about getting sure. this is wrong, but that was the, that was quite a, so it, what I heard was, yes, we do focus on those 10 who have that type of things. My other question, and very quickly, if any of the three of you would like to answer it, one of the things that comes up over and over again is that the public resource, it's a public agency, there are reports of investigations, and some, some of them say that it was a wolf depredation, and some of them don't. That's Oh, that seems like public information and maybe it could be helpful to inform people. So are there people among the three of you who do not feel that it's useful to get that information out there? And if we do the information on the lethal takes, a little bit less on the others. Is there anybody that thinks we should stick with what that we that there's no value in putting that information out to the public? Chair, well, I can get started um, because we I also raised that particular issue. I do want to clarify that that change is fairly recent. So ODFNW used to share investigation reports with quite a great deal of details. I would say that was helpful to a understanding when the predation happened, because sometimes it's a, there's a difference between when the incident happened versus when ODFNW did the investigation. And of course, other nature related to that particular incident. Since I would say the last six months or so, that has shifted um, significantly. So now it's like a line item, basic information that this happened, and that's all we know. We don't get any more details. That's the part that we would really like because it definitely helps us understand what were the circumstances for research purposes. Also, it gives us data in understanding what causes predations under certain circumstances, but also it gives public the trust and transparency to understand that, yes, everything that was could have been done was done and no other options were available. Um, but we don't get that anymore. I 
I think we're go ahead. Mr. Yeah, Hatfield, I have a, um, a wee bit of a process question here. Um, so um, I'm, I'm so grateful for the panel. Thank you. And there are some questions that have come up from them, uh, you know, things that I'd like to follow up with that I think are appropriate to follow up with staff about. So is that what we're going to do? We're going to have a little bit of time for that a bit or do we talk about those things now? Sure. Well, and um, Commissioner, I have to write it. So we're going to have a, a second panel on illegal take, and then Nick's kind of round us out. I'm um, just talking about how we're moving forward on implementation. And then I think we're going to be closing with some time for the commission discussion and, and further questions. So I think there should be time towards the end. OK, just to dive a little deeper into some of the good points that were make, made um, by the panelists that I'd like to get some further. Yeah. OK, good. Thank you. With that, shall we go to the next panels? Sure. Um, thank you thank again you to all, all the panelists. Very, much. very helpful to hear from you all. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think with that, uh, we have Nick Danielle and John. And who's coming from OSB? Sitting in your seat, sorry. You're on the next brand new effort. Yeah, you thought it just not moving? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you move chairs. <laughs> Cheers. So uh, it was supposed to be rural and we had to read this down today. I wanted to have a second panel discussion about a legal take, which as probably many of you have been hearing, has been um, increasing in Oregon. And it's an issue that's particularly um, at the forefront of the department's mind and something that we know we need to get a handle on. And so we wanted to have a discussion with the panelists here today to share their perspectives on a legal take. Um, and and then uh, to kind of set the stage for that, we're going to have Roblin present on what we know about that. And um, thanks to Michelle and Roxy, I think we're in a better place with our AV system in the room here. So Roblin's able to advance from from her position. For the folks listening online, I apologize, but there is going to be a significant delay, so the words might not be lining up with what's on the screen. Um, but I'm really sorry about that, and uh, we'll have to make do. So moving on. <laughs> Thank you. So earlier I talked about how successfully wolves have recolonized Oregon. We have a plan that's allowed that to happen and wolves are typically quite successful. But recently there's been a new challenge as illegal take has increased. So far, 88% of known wolf deaths in Oregon have been human caused. In all places where wolves and humans live, humans are most likely to be the largest cause of death, either directly or accidentally. Wolf management is going to be harder in Oregon than it is in some of the northern Rocky Mountains because Oregon has a much higher human population. If you add the population of Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho, you still have to double it to get to the population of Oregon. And then you have to have it in 70% less space. We have high prey densities that allows for a large wolf population, but we have fewer large wilderness areas, higher road density, and a much higher overlap with wolf territories and livestock grazing. This high human density increases the risk of negative encounters, and over the last five years, we've seen an increase in indicators that wolves are using areas where there is more overlap with people than they did before, such as road killed wolves, human safety reports and take, increased depredation, lethal removals for chronic depredation, caught in the act take, and illegal opp opportunistic shootings. All of those have increased during a time when the population did not increase at the same rate. This high uh, on of the known wolf mortalities for collared and uncollared wolves this is uncollared and collared. More than one third have been killed illegally. 30 wolves have been shot unlawfully. The first was back in 2000 and poaching has increased over the years. Four shooting deaths have been prosecuted in the courts, two in the federally protected area and two in Oregon State Police's jurisdiction. Two of those shootings, one in the east and one in the west, were immediately reported to ODFW by the shooters as mistaken identity, identity when they thought they were coyotes. ODFW has created multiple resources to help hunters, ranchers distinguish wolves from coyotes. For poisonings, 16 wolves have died of poison in eight different pack areas. 
Five more are strongly suspected as poison deaths, but the carcass was not picked up or the poison was not identified. Poisoning appears to be a year-round activity, and two poisonings have been confirmed at wolf denning areas. No poisoning cases have been solved or prosecuted in Oregon yet. This map shows that poaching is a statewide issue, but focused mostly in Northeast where there are more wolves. This, these maps, it's hard to see the numbers, but inside each circle, there's a number, maybe anywhere between one and seven, and it shows wolves that were confirmed as, eagerly, as illegally shot or poisoned. Of course, this is just documentation of known take. Just as with poaching of other wildlife, maybe many or maybe even most cases are undocumented. With poison, there's a high potential for multiple wolves to be killed at the same time, but sometimes we may only find the wolves that are radio collared. In a couple areas in Oregon, we see areas that previously had multiple packs now have vacant habitat or new packs that start and then fail. This could suggest that there's ongoing poisoning. Wolf monitoring has shown and the wolf plan has predicted that human cause mortality is the highest documented source of wolf mortality on an annual basis. While authorized take continues to be carefully tracked and regulated, poaching take is the greatest concern as it's difficult to document and to track or have influence over. We need to qualify all of this with the knowledge that wolf populations are resilient. Even in protected areas like Yellowstone, wolf packs are dynamic and often have changing are changing based on deaths of, of wolves in the pack. When a young wolf dies, often there is no effect on the pack. When a breeder is lost, a new mate may be found or a pack may break up or be replaced soon with a new wolf building a new pack. Mortality numbers do not mean much without context regarding impacts and determining if mortalities are additive or compensatory. Fortunately, the wolf plan gives us context for what varying degrees of mortality mean in terms of potential population trajectory. The good news is that currently the documented mortality levels for total mortality and human caused mortality are well below the estimated thresholds where the population might decline. The documented rates have not exceeded the 20% for human caused mortality, the highest was 13% in 2009, or for total mortality, 32% for total mortality, that's the threshold for when the population might decline. It was 13% in 2021 suggesting that documented mortalities are not resulting in a population decline. But I hear Sristi's concern about 2023. And we have not started our year-end count. And so normally I, anybody asks me anything about what the population is going to be for next count, I say, I don't know. But I wanted to just go ahead and take the numbers we have for mortality for this year because it is higher than we've ever had before. And I wanted to kind of look at that in these thresholds and see where we're at. And even with this year, it shows 14% for human cause compared to the 20% threshold for decline and 16% for total mortality compared to the 32% total um, mortality rate for decline. There's over 3,000 wolves in the Northern Rocky Mountains where just there were zero just 35 years ago. Biologically, the recolonization of wolves in Oregon has been successful. This increase has happened under all previous and current versions of the Oregon Wolf Plan, a plan that's allowed for conservation of wolves and for more management flexibility to address conflict as the wolf population has grown. But as directed under the plan, we will continue to monitor any conservation threats to the population and illegal take is a significant problem. Thanks, Roblin. So I think, uh, as Dr. Kamal mentioned in the previous panel, we're all going to be in agreement here that we need to get a handle on this. And we want to invite the three panelists here today to share their perspectives on it and how we might do go about doing that. So we're going to start with uh, Sergeant Sear here, who's going to share perspectives from OSP. Thank you. Uh, my name is Isaac Sear. I'm a sergeant with the Oregon State Police and the Fish and Wildlife Division. I'm stationed in Baker City and I supervise fish and wildlife troopers in Baker and Mount Heard County. The Oregon State Police has approximately 128 officers assigned to the Fish and Wildlife Division in the state of Oregon. These officers ensure compliance with the laws and regulations that protect and enhance the long term health and equitable utilization of Oregon's fish and wildlife resources and the habitat they depend on. 
Our patrol area covers approximately 100,000 square miles. Unfortunately, poaching in Oregon is an issue and wolves are not immune to that. The unlawful taking of wolves in Oregon is an enforcement priority for OSP's Fish and Wildlife Troopers in a matter uh, that's taken very seriously. The Oregon State Police has specific operating procedures within our policies related to the unlawful take of wolves in Oregon. Uh, uh, OSP does not have specific operating procedures within policy for the unlawful take of any other big game animals, so full we'll search, especially in that regard. Uh, detailed in the policy, all locations west of highways 395, 78, and 95, wolves are federally protected in the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, maintains authority over wall, all wolf harassment and take in that area. If troopers become aware of a wolf-related incident in this area, it's referred to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. All areas east of that boundary, Fish and Wildlife Troopers are responsible for investigating wolf harassment and take. <clears throat> the moment a Fish and Wildlife Trooper becomes aware of a complaint regarding the take of a wolf, that member by policy has to immediately make notification through their chain of command to make sure the appropriate people within OSP ODFW and if applicable, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are informed. The supervisor, supervisor, Fish and Wildlife Sergeant, like myself, then immediately notifies the East Region Fish and Wildlife Lieutenant, the ODFW District Biologist for the area, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service agent when applicable. Typically, at this point, OSP and ODFW coordinate a joint response to the incident. Notification up the OSP and ODFW chain. Uh, continues with the respective agencies to ensure everyone is informed of the incident and the news travels pretty quickly. Uh, if the take is under the, juris the state jurisdiction, a Fish and Wildlife Trooper will respond and conduct a thorough investigation to determine the legality of a take. In certain circumstances, a take could be legal. For example, a producer protecting livestock and or working dogs or any member of the public protecting themselves from what they believe to be a threat to human safety. Often ODFW informs us of a potentially dead wolf when a collar, wolf's collar emits a mortality signal. Callers give off the mortality signal after a predetermined period of inactivity. Uh, not all wolves in the state of Oregon have collar. No matter the time of year or the type of weather, OSP Fish and Wildlife Troopers and ODFW personnel respond to these incidents. Over the years, personnel have responded by trucks, ATVs, UTVs, snowmobiles, helicopters, uh, long cross country hikes, etc. When responding to these incidents, consideration must be given to whether it took place on public land versus private land. Incidents on private lands have to involve permission from the landowner and or uh, a search warrant where necessary. At times, permission from the landowner takes a while. This usually occurs on rural properties with no dwellings, and we have to determine who the landowner is with mapping programs and assessor's records if we don't already know that. Then we have to figure out a way to get a hold of them in a timely manner. Sometimes these landowners are absentee landowners, and it can take a while to track them down and gain permission. Once on scene, Fish and Wildlife Troopers, most often accompanied by ODFW personnel, will conduct a thorough investigation into the incident. This involves determining the method of take, searching for and locating any evidence, documenting said evidence, taking scene photographs, utilizing metal detectors and other tools searching landscape for evidence uh, or other clues, recording pertinent GPS locations, packing up all evidence to include the wolf and transporting it back to an OSP facility for processing. Often the wolf and associated evidence are in remote locations that are inaccessible to vehicles. Evidentiary items have to be uh, packed out with backpacks and or pack boards at times. Uh, Fish and wildlife troopers have even utilized helicopters with baskets in tow to fly out wolf carcasses and evidence from remote areas. I personally experienced this during an investigation in the middle of the winter in the feeding wildlife management unit. Uh, after the scene is processed and the evidence is brought back for analysis, the investigation continues. For OSP policy, a necropsy is performed on wolves that are unlawfully taken and, and or die under suspicious circumstances. OSP personnel will have to make a request through a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service agent who authorizes the neat crop at the United States Fish and Wildlife Service Lab, which is in Ashland, Oregon. 
at that point in time, an OSP Fish and Wildlife pilot then flies the deceased wolf to the Ashland lab for the necropsy. At the lab, a thorough necropsy is conducted by a doctor of veterinary medicine who specializes in veterinary pathology. At the conclusion of the examination, OSP received a detailed final report from them. When poison is suspected, the veterinary pathologist 